Three components, fuel, heat, and oxygen, are necessary for a fire to ignite and spread. These three components are known as the fire triangle. Fuel simply refers to the combustible material that burns and in the case of a forest fire, typically consists of vegetation. Dead, dry vegetation such as leaf litter or dead wood is usually more flammable than living tissue. The second component of the fire triangle is oxygen, which is always present in the air. The third component, heat, can be provided by a lightning strike or by humans in the form of a carelessly discarded match or cigarette. All three components of the triangle must be present for a fire to start. The fire will die if any one of the components is eliminated. Firefighters use this principle to their advantage when trying to control a forest fire. For example, they may stop a fire's progress by eliminating potential fuels with a fire line, an area around the perimeter of the fire which has been cleared of vegetation or fuels and which the fire therefore cannot cross. They can deprive the fire of oxygen by smothering it with a chemical, fire retardant, or water that is called a wet line. Frequent wildfires have shaped the North American landscape for thousands of years. As a result, most native plants and animal species and plant communities have evolved, adapted, and are often dependent upon the reoccurrence of fire. Rogue Valley summers are hot and dry enough that lightning ignited fires occur frequently. At the Table Rocks, the landscape historically experienced low intensity fire as often as every three to five years. In addition to lightning caused fires, Native Americans in this region dramatically shaped the landscape by intentionally lighting fire in the forest. The historic record, say for instance when the early uh, explorers came through here, the Wilkes Expedition, 1841, way back, they came through here and they didn't record a lot of plant information, they didn't record a lot of Native American information, but what they did record was really important. On the outskirts of Ashland, they noticed a woman who was so busy setting fire to the landscape that she paid the exploring expedition scant attention. She was out there doing her job. I think she may have been burning the landscape to encourage this little plant right here, Tarwe. Fire served as a tool to extensively manage the land and maintain a healthy ecosystem, and it is still used by land managers today. It also served a variety of other purposes. The use of fire promotes healthier, more abundant food resources. It maintains open habitat for deer and elk, which prefer freshly sprouted vegetation. In turn, large game is easier to hunt in cleared areas. Native Americans used fire as a tool during warfare to force enemy tribes to evacuate their homes. Smoke from fires was used as a cover or to signal tribal members to gather for warfare. There are many different types of fire in nature. These can be classified in various ways, depending on the topic at hand. For the majority of the lessons on fire ecology, the fires are classified by their level of intensity. Low intensity fires burn with less severity and lower heat and high-intensity fires burn with greater severity and higher heat. In most plant communities in our region, a higher-intensity fire causes greater ecological impact. Thus, if a fire is a low-intensity fire, it has little ecological damage and serves an important part of a healthy ecosystem in southwestern Oregon. Occasional high-intensity fires are a part of our historical fire pattern. Some plant communities, like the lodgepole pine community, rely on high-intensity fires for regeneration. Lodgepole pine have serotonous cones dependent on fire to open and disperse their seeds. This plant community is usually involved in high-intensity, high-severity fires, resulting in high mortality of the parent plant. However, the frequency of high-intensity fires in southwestern Oregon's landscape has increased significantly with the land management practice of fire suppression and consequential buildup of fuels. So one of the key topics that we deal with um, as a land management agency within the Bureau of Land Management is fire ecology. Um, because we've taken fire out of our ecosystem based on the numbers of people that are living in what's called the wildland urban interface, it's where the forests and people meet, 
and also because of our misunderstanding of the importance of fire in our environment. Much of our ecosystem today looks like a thick brush area, like a bomb waiting to happen. So if you were to get a lightning strike in a spot like this, because it hasn't been thinned out by fire, natural fire, it is so thick at this point that literally if a lightning were to strike here, it would be a bomb that would explode into a major fire. Because of the extreme heat generated by a high intensity fire, a number of damaging ecological impacts can occur, including sterilization of soil. This results in a longer ecological recovery. With a long history of frequent fire in the landscape, many plants in our region are adapted to survive in environments with fire. Some plants even depend on fire to help them grow and disperse. There are various adaptations plants use to survive and live with fire. Plant species can typically be classified into five different categories based on their adaptation, though some can fit into more than one category. Resistors are the species that can survive moderate to low intensity fires with little or no damage. Some adaptations of resistors include thick bark to shield them from fire, deep roots protected from fire, the shedding of their lower branches to prevent fire from climbing, and moist short needles or leaves that are hard to burn. Some examples include ponderosa pine, sugar pine, and Douglas fir. Sprouters are the species that endure fire. Sprouters respout from their roots, trunks, limbs, and or crown after a burn. Many shrubs are sprouters. Some of these species also have hard shelled seeds relying on fire to crack them open. While the parent plant may be injured in a fire, the new sprouts are able to grow in nutrient rich soil and have less competition. Some examples include oak, aspen, and madrone. What we're looking at here is another clue that although it's been a while, fire has occurred on the table rocks. It's uncommon to see a tree that has multiple stalks. Well, the plants and trees in this area have all adapted to a consistent regime of fire. Many of them have developed adaptations that help them survive and sometimes even thrive from fire. In the case of the madrone tree, it has a, a big root system called a burl that although a fire will come through and maybe destroy the main stalk, it doesn't destroy the burl. Later, it'll send out sprouts. Often they're in the shape of a circle, which is a sign that the tree is still very alive and can go on living for hundreds of years. Cedars are adapted to evade fire by shedding lots of seeds that sprout after fire. These sprouts thrive from the rich nutrients recycled into the soil. Right after a fire is a prime time for a plant to disperse its seeds and germinate because there is more space to grow and less competition for resources like sunlight, water, and nutrients. Many cedars are dependent on fire to create the habitat needed for their seedlings to sprout and grow. Cedars are not invaders because they already inhabit the area before the fire and their population does not spread as rapidly as invaders. Some examples include buckbrush, lodgepole pine, and manzanita. Invaders take over recently burned areas. Their populations are either limited or unknown prior to fire. Invaders tend to have seeds that are highly dispersive by wind, animals, or people. Many invaders are noxious weeds that take over areas after disturbances such as fire, flood, or development. Some examples include star thistle, fireweed, and scotch broom. Avoiders are least adapted to fire because they grow in areas where fire does not normally occur. They are typically found near water or in high elevations. Avoiders are a late successional species, thus they are not found in recently burned areas. Avoiders have thin bark, shallow roots, and lots of resin, which can help a fire spread. Few avoiders survive moderate to high intensity fires. Some examples include white fir, vine maple, western red cedar, and western hemlock. Just as some plant species need fire to regenerate, some plant communities require periodic fire to maintain their health or even their existence. Grasslands and oak savanna are two such fire-dependent plant communities. A light surface fire will not kill an established oak tree, but will thin out undergrowth and seedlings of other plant species which would otherwise encroach on the open, grassy understory of the oak savanna. 
Animal species also rely on fire to stimulate new plant growth for foraging and to maintain diverse habitat types. Burned plants give the soil nutrients. Nutrients from burned organic material are recycled back into the earth and enrich the soil. Seeds of many plants will actually lay dormant in the soil until there is a fire, and then they will sprout in the nutrient-rich soil. Plants like buckbrush and manzanita have seeds with a hard shell that require the heat from fire to break them open so they can sprout. Both of these brush species encourage fire by shedding their barks and twigs. When burned, nutrients from this fire-prone fuel load are recycled into the soil below the plant. Fire clears brush and debris that can cover the forest floor and prevent other plants from sprouting. Low-intensity fires that clear brush and debris decrease the likelihood of a large, severe wildfire. In order to remain healthy, plants and trees need space to obtain proper nutrients, sunlight, and water. When fire is suppressed, trees become crowded and shade-tolerant species dominate, decreasing a forest's diversity. A diverse forest is a healthy forest, providing a greater variety of habitats and food for wildlife, as well as forest products for humans. Regular intervals of fire help to keep pests and diseases from taking over plant communities, helping keep the plants healthy. Many animals depend on plants as a food source. An animal's survival can be threatened when diseases and pests take over a plant community. Regular, low-intensity fire intervals destroys noxious weed infestations, making more room and a healthier environment for native plants. However, high-intensity fires may actually help noxious weeds spread because they do well in disturbed areas. Trees that do not survive a forest fire turn into food and homes for bugs and small cavity-nesting animals. There are actually more living species in and on a dead log than a live tree. Fire helps create these important habitats and maintain a diverse and healthy forest. Despite the many benefits of fire, for several decades, fire suppression was the accepted policy on public lands. Prior to the dominance of fire suppression as a land management strategy, most Western ecosystems experienced relatively frequent low to moderate severity fires that burned off leaf litter, underbrush, and dead vegetation, preventing these fuels from accumulating. Suppressing these natural fires has allowed fuel to build up, increasing the risk and frequency of high-intensity, high-severity fire. Fire suppression can have negative effects on many fire-dependent species, such as an increase in disease, insect infestation, and displacement by non-native weeds. Returning fire to the ecosystem of the West is a serious and important challenge facing land managers today. Decades of fire suppression have resulted in a naturally heavy fuel loads. Suburban development expanded the wildland urban interface or the area where wildland and development meet. Thus, reintroducing fire must be done with the utmost planning and precaution often a combination of practices, such as reducing fuel loads by manually removing overgrown vegetation, planning prescribed burns, and managing naturally ignited fires is necessary. By gradually restoring natural fire patterns on public lands, we can protect ecosystem health, natural resources, human life, communities and property.